Right, so I'd like to welcome uh, Heather Buchanan to this short video where we're going to look at the sort of differences and similarities between something called materials development and something called materials writing. Uh, Heather, do you just want to quickly introduce yourself, say what you do, what your involvement is with materials development and writing? Yeah, yeah. So hi, um, Heather Buchanan. I uh, currently work at the University of York. Uh, where I teach on the MA TESOL course. Uh, previously, I worked at um, Leeds Beckett University for a long time, um, leading an MA in ELT. Also, um, I taught materials development there um, as a, an MA module. Um, I've also um, co-written um, a global course book for Oxford University Press. And most recently, I've brought out an edited book with Julie Norton from the University of Leicester, which is called The Routledge Handbook of Materials Development for Language Teaching, of which John is one of our chapter writers. So we're very grateful to John for that. Uh, thank you, Heather. I recently got my copy of the book and it's, I was um, mm -hmm. impressed to be alongside the great and good list of names, including all sorts of people in there. It's, it's packed full, as you can see. It's got a bit of a width to it, so you'll find, find plenty of content. Um, but it is the starting hairs point. All the hairs are all a result. No, what? Sorry? The grey hairs are all a result. Yes. <laughs> uh, well, it did get rather interrupted by COVID, didn't it? Um, it did, yes. But... Uh, it, it's it's an interesting title and it's a nice starting point because of course it's the Rootledge Handbook of Materials Development and I've also been involved in a book called Materials Writing and one of the questions that always comes up particularly from people I train is what is the difference between materials development and materials writing and I thought this was quite a nice sort of springboard just to explore what the differences and similarities might be are they very different or is there some sort of crossover I thought I'd start a discussion with a little quote from the book which I haven't told Heather about I'm just going to throw it at her but I'd like you just to explain it to me Heather because I had to read it a few times just to kind of get it um, so you're describing in the introduction uh, Julia wrote this as well uh, in the introduction it says um, this handbook challenges the perception of materials development as an atheoretical activity. This is quoting somebody called Samuda, who I don't know. So it's an atheoretical activity by demonstrating through the, throughout the interface between theory and practice, thereby narrowing this perceived gap. So if we break that quote down, first of all, the perception of materials development as an a theoretical activity. I always thought materials development was considered a theoretical activity. Okay, as opposed to materials writing. Well, if we were to contrast the two, um, I think there's a sort of tendency where materials development is the term used in universities on MA courses. So it's, you would, you would suspect it's very linked with theory perhaps. Whereas materials writing for me is more about a sort of product approach. I know I've got to produce a worksheet in a certain way. I've got to produce a course book in a certain kind of way. So for me, there's a kind of materials development is more concerned about process. Materials writing is concerned about product, which would suggest materials writing has a tendency to be less theoretical or a theoretical, I guess. And materials development tends to be more theoretical. So I didn't quite get the Samuda quote. Yeah, so I think when um, Samuda wrote that, I think that she was talking about what you're, you're referring to as materials writing okay. in that, you know, here I'm going to write a worksheet for my students. You know, I'm going to write 10 multiple choice questions. How do I do that? Um, this is kind of technical knowledge involved in um, in doing that, let's get it done and out there, rather than, you know, what are my principles of learning and teaching? What, how do I believe students learn English? And how do I believe it? What is, do I believe is the best way to teach them? And starting from there and sort of going towards, um, you know, the, the finished product from 
starting with theory. So I think that when I think Virginia Samuda was talking about the way often, particularly when people write for publication, that they're just sort of very focused on the product, how to do it, this is the way to do it. This is the kind of the best way, the right way, the successful way, rather than looking at the thinking about um, the theories and the principles that underlie um, what they're doing. So in a way there, we were using, we were um, using materials development and, you know, I, I think, yeah, kind of interchangeably with materials writing in a sense. I think that they're both the same thing materials writing. I think materials writing is narrower than materials development because materials development includes um, other things like um, evaluating materials, adapting materials and whatever, which I think materials writing doesn't really. Um, so, but there is a tendency for materials development to um, be used more by people on the academic side, the materials writing tends often to be used by people on the practical stroke publishing side of it. And so I'm not sure whether there should be such a dichotomy, but I think that often the terms are used by the different groups of people. How did you find it in reality, though, when you worked on Navigate, for example, and you were coming or, or any published course material, when you're mm. coming at it from that sort of more, we've got to have an end product, we've got to publish something, but you're also, you've got a, you know, a foot in sort of the academic side on the university course. Did you, did you find when you were writing, you were asked to write for a publisher versus to what perhaps you were telling your students on your materials development course, did you find a conflict there? Uh, that's an interesting question. Um, I don't think I found a conflict so much as um, I didn't always agree with everything that I was asked to do. Um, but I think that's probably true of every writer that's writing for every publisher. You know, I think we all have our own particular way that we like to, you know, we might have our little hobby horse that, you know, materials have to be this or they really should be this. And I hate ones that do that. And so I came across that, but, you know, I've spent a lot of my career training teachers on CELTAs and DELTAs and things like that. Um, and, you know, alongside the materials development stuff. And so, you know, on CELTAs and DELTAs, you can, you don't have the luxury of sitting, you know, thinking about every theory behind every single decision, because often um, decisions are there for kind of practical reasons as well and so I think because I was so used to just thinking about making things work in the classroom as well as looking at materials in a more academic way I don't think that was really that much of an issue for me but there were some there were there were some issues that came up that I was quite surprised at you know uh, for example the um, the topic of authenticity I was really amazed at what people in the publishing world called an authentic material. And it was actually one that they'd written themselves. <laughs> oh, but I had that recently. I mean, I worked on some video materials recently um, that we designed for a course. Uh, and on Facebook, somebody picked me up on it and said, they're not authentic because you've created them for the classroom. And for a while, I got into a bit of back and forth discussion because for me, they, they are authentic. We hadn't scripted them. We'd gone in with some questions. We'd taken authentic speakers. We'd interviewed them. Yes, we, we mm -hmm. were, were linking the videos with, a, say, a particular unit of the book, but mm -hmm. they, were, they were authentic responses. They were personal. Um, you know, the people were speaking more or less as they would speak normally. For me, that, that was authentic. I didn't see that there was a debate to it, but clearly there is this idea as soon as you, I and mean, it's a very purist point of view that if you design materials for the classroom specifically for it, then they're no longer authentic. I think that's a bit questionable. 
And I have sat in conferences listening to that debate for far mm. too many hours and actually it doesn't really get you anywhere anyway to some extent. I think you can go on forever and I think that you can be very purist, as you say, about authentic materials, but authentic materials are not always, you know, in their pure form, going to be what's going to be work in the classroom and they're never going to appear in that many course books and whatever. Um, mm. But it's an interesting issue, that difference between developments and materials writing and that, that, that kind of our view on things like authenticity, I think, possibly changes. Um, mm -hmm. And also, I think it's interesting when I had the little bit of materials development work I've done on MA courses, of course, a, a student is developing the materials for their context, they're applying their view of language teaching and language learning. And they, they almost, the we go back to this idea that it's very process driven because you're concerned with the process of the creative materials. But there has to be a point for me anyway, where you come up with an end product. And it's also potentially that I could hand it to someone else to go and teach with it. And that's giving it to someone else to teach with that has a huge impact on material as well. And that's certainly the concern, I think, of the materials writer, perhaps less so in materials development, I don't know. Yeah, I think some of it is um, to do with what you're doing it for, because if you're um, running materials development courses on um, as part of a, an MA, for example, you know, you want probably want people to be able to to write their materials. But the idea is much more about um, developing the teacher, developing the student and their awareness of everything, their understanding of everything, than it is being able to write a good gap fill um, exercise or something like that. And so I think it's, it's a much more holistic approach to, um, it's, it's kind of, it's materials development can be a tool to, a, a way to, um, develop people's awareness generally of language teaching and learning because via those materials you know if you're if you're looking at materials and analyzing them well then you're raising somebody's awareness of what is actually going on in those materials and why they're doing what they're doing and so I think it's a, it's a different focus isn't it so the the focus in that case is more on the participant and not the final product and what that's going to be like when it's used in the classroom. Right. I mean, that ties in with a few other words when I was brainstorming words to describe development versus writing. So I had process versus product. Um, mm. Materials development is more focused on fostering teacher development, whereas materials writing, I think the focus is on fostering teacher skill to some extent, like um, it, it always surprises me on teacher training courses like the diploma and so on, that teachers aren't just taught how to technically write an exercise well, because there are certain sort of basic principles. So there's a sort of a, a technical side. And if we think about the teacher training approach, there's that sort of idea of a craft approach where you're teaching someone a craft, one way to do it, and then you've got a sort of reflective or analytical approach. Mm -hmm. And certainly the craft model, I think, often ties in with the sort of materials writing course I might run, though obviously, you know, we take a reflective approach as well. Um, mm. I wondered uh, if we were to look at accusations, and I was thinking about this because I, I did have an academic suggest that what I did was actually de-skilling for teachers, because I'm, I'm sort of producing materials so that they don't have to produce materials, because I was saying my job is to provide materials that will work in a teacher in a classroom who might be teaching 30, 40 contact hours a week, they don't have time to be materials mm -hmm. writers. So his suggestion was to say, yes, but you're de-skilling them because you're removing that skill they need to develop. Um, and equally, I said, yeah, but the danger with materials development is you're not reflecting what happens in a real classroom. So there was that kind of conflict. I don't know when mm. you've ever come up against that at all. Yeah, well, actually, this, this issue was one of the things that we talked about in the IETEFL talk that Julie and I did um, this year because um, we were looking at um, the discourses that um, different stakeholders use to talk about course books and one of the things was um, about power and one of the things was about agency 
and this idea that the the course book or any kind of materials might take away the agency from the teacher and from the students is an accusation but you know it depends how you look at it because it can't take away your agency if you don't let it so if you if your attitude is well you know the course book's telling me what I have to do and so you know I have to start at page one and work through everything whether it's suitable for my students or not well then that's ridiculous as far as I'm concerned. It's supposed to be there as a tool for you to use in the way that is going to be effective with your students. And so, you know, I think the teacher has to take the agency and has to make use of that material with their students. You know, it's not the course books writer's um, job to be able to more or less teach that lesson for them. I think that's ridiculous. And so I think you, you get a lot of accusations on bo in both camps for and against course books. But in to some extent, I think they can both be a little bit unreasonable, you know, because you kind of accuse each other of things that are just not really true. And I think this agency point is a good case in point. Yeah, I mean, we make some assumptions then if we're suggesting that course materials, when we write them, will will de-skill a teacher. We're making assumptions about, we're kind of stereotyping teachers as well. I mean, I think back to my early stages of teaching when I had a huge workload, I had to work with course books and I was expected to because of the syllabus. But actually, I learned an awful lot about lesson structure and eventually had to write my own materials because I learned from using other people's materials what what makes material that work in the classroom and so on so it can actually be it can be a method of training as well I think one of the chapters in your book covers that the sort of the wash back from teachers using materials in terms of learning then how to develop their own materials is important yeah I think one of the things uh, when I was involved in the navigate project I think one of the things at the beginning that really um was new and different for me was that I was trying to write materials for people who knew how to teach mm -hmm. and um, I suppose knew how to teach in a way that I'm familiar with, you know, with, according to my background here. And the feedback I got from editors was that um, not that, you know, people might not know how to teach, but that, that people who were gonna be using the course book might be looking for a lot more structure and scaffold than what I was putting in there. Because I suppose I started out writing materials in the, the kind of materials that I might like to use myself that maybe gave me quite a lot of freedom. And so things like having open-ended questions in there and not, where things where there's not really a right or wrong answer or getting students to work things out for themselves, where the teacher would then have to get involved in helping them with that, rather than, you know, asking a question and here's the answer. And, and that was something that um, I found a little bit difficult at the beginning, because it wasn't the way that I wanted my materials to be taught. But then I had to learn that when they were being designed to be used right across the world, um, by lots of teachers with different backgrounds, different language proficiencies in different contexts and whatever. That very kind of loose approach to how you might write your own materials for your own classroom was just not going to work. Yeah, I mean, I think with materials writing, you have to you have to kind of probably let go of the material a lot more than you might in materials development in terms of thinking. I need to write materials that will work for somebody who's a very kind of creative, experienced teacher who uh, might spend large parts of the lesson not even referring to the course book. And equally, I've got to write material that's going to work for the teacher who literally is maybe just qualified, just start, it's their first week yeah. of teaching and they, they've got to they've got to have a lesson that, and they need to start at number one and finish at number 10 kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And those mm -hmm. kinds of questions where you know, question one, if you've got an answer is, and the student says, well, is the answer yes or no? And the teacher says, well, it depends. 
that's just not going to satisfy people and so open-ended questions become problematic in that sense yeah that's right yeah i think another difference in a way between the the materials writing and the materials development they're not camps but these two different things um is the focus on commercial writing because um i think that in a lot of the writing that you'll find about materials development there's a lot of criticism about um, writing for publication. You know, the, the publishers, the big bad organisation that's trying to make a lot of money mm -hmm. um, and not in not being prepared to take risks enough and not being prepared to, um, you know, be kind of, you know, follow theory and things like that. Whereas you often find in the materials writing camp that people just accept um that um you know writing is a commercial activity and things have to be done in a particular way in order to sell books and in order for us to to make a living so julie and i you know try to um straddle both of these because we we don't see why they have to be so different and you know we think that there shouldn't be you know well where the theoretical people where the practical people and you know we should you know there's never any kind of common ground we think that um you know materials have to be sold for publication that is also it's life. not borne out i mean um the university of warwick has a wonderful elt archive and you can pick yeah. up a course book from 1980 and compare mm -hmm. it to a course book in 2020 and you will see the changes and you will see the influence of theory um you you will see course books reflecting change in thought about how language learning happens it just by its nature happens more slowly and it yeah. has to reflect acceptance in different parts of the world where perhaps the material is being used so if you've got somebody in the sort of materials development camp saying yes but that's not reflecting language acquisition theory as we now see it well first of all that's got to be tried and tested and then it's going to take time to influence. Um, I mean, the most obvious example for me would be somebody like Michael Lewis talking about the lexical approach in the 1990s. And I went to see him and loved his work. But it's take, it took maybe 20 years before you really saw the impact of the lexical approach on what was happening in course books, just by the nature of it took time for people to learn about it, understand it, see the benefits of it, try it out in class, and then eventually for it to work its way into the course book. So there's always yeah. a bit of catch up going on and then it depends, you know, where the book's going and you can go to parts of the world where people won't have heard of the lexical approach and even, uh, you know, nowadays people haven't heard of it. So they, these kinds of things take, take time to filter in. Yeah, and I agree. Materials writing, yeah. I agree. And I think that, um, you know, I think it's true that, um, you know, publishing is by nature quite conservative and things do change slowly. Um, not every um, new theoretical approach is going to be sort of, you know, usable and, and workable for people in the classroom. It's, it's not all practical. And sometimes what the theory says is not what students want. And, and that's where sometimes you find differences as well but i think the lexical yeah, and also sometimes the, really the, the theory or whatever doesn't reflect your experience as a teacher of what really mm -hmm. happens in the classroom i mean you know you can hit, read theory that happens and you think yes but actually the reality of the classroom this is what happens and it doesn't the two things don't necessarily match up yeah and that might be that you're just not ready for that theory yet or it might be that it's never going to really happen because there are certain things that just won't ever happen. And so, um, yeah, I think you've, you've always got to be mindful of what goes on in the classroom when you come up with a theory or when you do research or whatever, because, you, you, you know, what happens as a, you know, the, the um, conclusions from research and recommendations from research are often very um, blinkered in a way. They're just taken in to consideration this one particular piece of research, and they're not. They don't always look at all the different things that have to be taken into consideration 
in the classroom. So um, two, two more words that I just want to contrast before we finish with development and writing. So would you see materials writing as encouraging more creativity and materials writing and covering, encouraging more technical skills? I only say this because in the chapter I wrote for the book, you let me include a kind of a mini syllabus of what to include on a teacher training course if you were teaching materials writing. And after I'd written it, when I was putting it together, I started to think, gosh, so much of this is just technical. Mm. Um, um, as an experienced writer, sometimes people say to me, how do you write that quickly? And, and a lot of it's just because I've learned basic technical skills, like how to put an exercise mm. together very quickly. But I wonder whether there's a danger that if you're with that emphasis on those technical skills you need, whether you lose sort of creativity and saying sort of waking up one day and thinking, well, what happens if we do it a completely different way? And I wonder whether develop, materials development encourages that much more. Uh, well, it's a very good question. I certainly think materials writing has more of an emphasis on the technical and I think materials development often doesn't have so much of an emphasis on the technical because I think they spend more time dealing with more, um, you know, theoretical issues and whatever. But I don't think you can be successful as a writer if you only have the technical. And I think the creative has to be there as well. Otherwise, you're not going to make it. Is that materials can, you that on a, can you teach creativity on a materials writing? That's the question, isn't it? it? I think, you know, the creativity has to be there. Otherwise, your materials might be technically brilliant, but they might be really dull and nobody will want to use them. But, um, I, yeah, it's something that I'm really interested in, actually, and I'm not sure whether we can actually teach creativity. I know Jill Hadfield's done some really interesting work about creativity and materials writing, um, but she doesn't talk about whether you actually can teach it. You probably can encourage it, but I think that, um, yeah, teaching technical skills must be much easier than teaching creativity. Well, it's easier. I tend to do it because I tend to find teachers come on my course with lots of creative ideas and lots of ideas but they're not tied together in a way that if they pre give these materials to another mm -hmm. teacher that other teacher can use it and mm -hmm. because they haven't applied sort of technical principles but mm -hmm. equally when teachers say to me where do you get ideas from where do you get creativity from I find it in the hardest part to sort of talk about why I choose one text over another or why one image works. Sometimes it just works, but if I try to define why I'm using that within materials, it might be quite hard to pin yeah, it. Yeah, because I, I think that a lot of um, that side of things is, is to do with intuition, really, and experience. And you're probably using quite an, an unconscious, um, intuitive knowledge that you've developed over years of writing to decide whether a text is going to work or not or a topic is going to work and it's really hard to put your finger on why you know why you've made that decision and I think um, you um, you make decisions really um, automatically as as you get more experienced as well you do um, although it's it's easy skill. to fall into routines and it's easy to get blinded by something. I mean, you might find something you think is very creative, very clever, but when you hand it to other people to use, you, the, the feedback just keeps coming back saying, look, this isn't working. And you think, okay, this, I'm just gonna have to let this one drop. I can't pursue mm -hmm. this one because mm -hmm. the, the, and that's why it's so important to constantly to give your materials to other teachers to try out and get their comments mm -hmm. as well. Yeah, Possibly. Keith Johnson did some really interesting work about creativity and well, the process of materials writing, and um, you know, and he did, and he identified some of the um, the kind of qualities of a skilled writer, and one of them is knowing when to abandon an idea. Um, yeah. You know, in sort of unskilled people, novice people sometimes keep going and going, trying to make something work. And somebody more experienced will get to the point where they think that's not going to work. I'm going to have to, you know, I might have spent two days working on this, but 
it's got to go and they start, they're, pre they're prepared to start again. And so it's quite interesting um, that kind of creativity works with other bits of your knowledge. Um, you know, you can't just go with the creativity because otherwise your materials probably won't work because you've got to bring practical things in as well, considerations in to, to balance that, to then get something that's going to be creative and technical, I think. Right. Thanks very much for Heather. We've run out of time and I know you're busy. If uh, you're interested in this discussion and want to explore it further, I recommend the Routledge Handbook of Materials Development for Language Teaching, edited by Julie North and Heather Buchanan, uh, packed full of lots of different chapters on different topics and aspects and continues the debate to some extent of uh, materials development versus materials writing. Thanks, Heather. And I will just say, if you are interested in getting it, don't be put off by the hardback price, which is scary, because the ebook is a lot more affordable. <laughs> and uh, and it's uh, the ebook version is available from the Rootledge website or where? Uh, yeah, I think it's on Amazon as well. It's, there's a Kindle edition. Okay, yeah. all yeah, good so online get... booksellers. Yeah. yeah, all over the place, I'm sure. All right. Thanks, Heather.